Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is uh, Christopher Mary, and I work for SolidCAD here in Canada. I'm also on the line here with Robert Pichinich from SolidCAD as well. And we also have with us uh, Christopher Crane from Autodesk. So hopefully uh, you guys can all hear me right now. But uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Um, it's not an open mic per se, but uh, feel free to enter questions in at any point in time. We'll do our best to uh, handle them as we go on here. But uh, what we're going to do is just kind of dive into uh, some power mill automation. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an expert on the subject. It's just a matter of uh, knowing how you can make the software do, you know, what, what you're looking for it to do. Um, whether it be a, a simple macro or it could be a, a advanced uh, automated plugin. So with that being said, let me just uh, kind of run through a, a couple slides here that I prepared. Okay, so um, SolidCAD, we have uh, quite a few offices across Canada, as you can see from the map here. So it doesn't matter if you're on the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, we've got a local office that can support you. So if you're looking for us to help out, feel free to reach reach out and we can, uh, we can be there for you. Just some of the things that we do, um, training, customization, uh, technical support. But today we're going to look at uh, a power mill here. Okay, so if you've not used power mill or if you are just kind of seeing what power mill has to offer, so high high speed strategies for uh, roughing and finishing. But uh, if you're looking at removing material quick and easily, uh, power mill has some really good strategies for that. Of course, two and a half D or two D milling. Uh, then we can get into some positional three plus two. Some really good tools. Um, I'd say uh, pretty unique tools in that aspect. Five axis, so uh, getting into uh, simultaneous live five. Power has a, a, a great supply of tool path strategies uh, dedicated on the five axis side. We also have some mer uh, mill turn strategies as well. So if you've got those machine centers out there that can. <laughs> you know, basically lock the uh, spindle out and use the C-axis, uh, we can support those machines as well. And of course, robotics. So industrial robotics uh, allows us to work with larger envelopes or, you know, work in those really hard to get at areas on the, on the part. And of course, automation. So when we talk automation, we can talk about um, a simple macro or templates or even just customizing the uh, environment itself. So the big question is why automate? Well, save time is number one. Consistency, gaining speed, we're always striving to be quicker and faster and reducing redundant operations. So how can power mill automate? Well, we can start off by just creating some simple uh, templates or saving some strategies, which we'll uh, look at today. Uh, macros. So macro could be um, a simple one command execution, or it could be multiple lines of, of code. APIs, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit as well, and user menus. So first things first, uh, what is a template? So a template would be a save strategy. So think of a, a, a tool path for uh, in, in Power Mill. So it could be maybe a roughing strategy that we've uh, recycled time and time again. And we know that this strategy works. Well, we can go ahead and save that strategy and uh, reuse it later on in any project. So we can save 2D tool paths, drilling, uh, drilling methods is a good example of a template as well. If you have not discovered drilling temp, um, methods, uh, this is a, a, probably an introductory uh, method into um, creating some automation when it comes to the drilling side. We won't touch on drilling methods today. Um, I've touched on them in the past. So uh, if you want to reacquaint yourself with that, you can always revisit uh, one of the old webinars that we did uh, a few months back. Roughing tool paths, finishing tool paths, 
We can also um, save a group of tools and tool paths and work planes as a template. So we, we wouldn't call this really a save strategy. We'd call this more or less like a template object. Okay, so what I wouldn't mind doing now is just kind of stopping this PowerPoint here and jumping into the software. And let's go ahead and just kind of look at these two options here. Okay, so you can see PowerMill is opened up. Um, it's basically bare bones at this point in time. I've done absolutely nothing to regards to customizing my interface. So the, the quick access toolbar up top is the day it was when I installed the software, as is the ribbon up top. Okay, so after my viewing toolbar, I've got nothing uh, to the right-hand side of it. So uh, first things first, I'm just going to go ahead and open up a PowerMelt project that I've already uh, recalculated. So I'm just going to minimize PowerMill. I'm going to jump into this folder on my desktop. And I'm going to take this project and bring it in. And let's go ahead and activate this toolpath. Okay. So this could be a toolpath strategy, uh, this three-quarter roughing toolpath. This could be a strategy that I want to use on subsequent parts uh, down the road. You know, I've got all the parameters stored exactly how I want them, even the tool that I want to use. So the thickness value has been set, the step over, the step down, you know, even speeds and feeds. In this case, have not been stored, but if I did override the, the initial speeds and feeds, I could save these off into a strategy. So what we're going to do is just simply right click on the toolpath in the Explorer. And the easiest way to store this and recycle it is to save it as a strategy. So you might have seen this in the past. Um, it's easy enough to click on it. But at this point in time, this is where uh, you might kind of hit a roadblock. OK, so if I want to store this strategy uh, for later use, the very first thing I need to do is create a folder. So I'm going to close that for now and just minimize PowerMill. And I'm going to go back to this folder on my desktop again. And I'm just going to go ahead and create a new folder. I'm going to call this one Roughing Strategies. Let's minimize that and go back into PowerMill. And the very first thing I'm going to do is uh, basically point PowerMill to look at that directory. Because right now, if we go into this Toolpath Strategy Selector, uh, nothing exists down below where probing uh, at the bottom of this list here. So let's close the strategy selector. And we're going to go into the group here, this macro group on our home tab. This little button, it's a, it's a sneaky little button here on the bottom right-hand corner. Most people probably just skip across it. But what this does is open up all of my PowerMill paths. So these PowerMill paths, depending on what we want PowerMill to look at, are just think of uh, arrows pointing to different directories that I want PowerMill to look at all the time. So the first thing I'm going to do down here is go into strategy paths. Then I need to set up that path. So I'm going to go to the browse option and I'm going to go into the desktop. And on the desktop, I'm going to go into my folder and I'm going to click on the folder that I just created, roughing strategies. And I'm going to close that dialog. So now the next time I go into my strategy selector, you're going to notice there's this folder down here now, uh, the folder that we just created. But it's going to be empty. So let's go back to square one. I'm going to right click on that toolpath, save it as a strategy. And now you'll notice that the path here has been populated. So I can go ahead and create multiple paths. Whatever's at the top is going to be at the top of this list. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. And this one might be uh, my three quarter inch roughing toolpath. And we're going to go ahead and save that. So be careful with naming conventions, very important. Um, so think of this, you know, as the in, in the Windows environment, 
Forward slashes, even quotation marks, uh, may not be allowed. Forward slashes for sure, I'm not quite sure about the, the uh, quotation mark. So let's just go ahead and name this. Uh, I usually name this without forward slashes or quotations, so I might just go 07500 for three quarter and save. Then I might do the same thing for the half inch and the quarter inch. So let's save this as a strategy. I'm gonna save it in the same location. Give it a name. And save it. And I'll repeat it with the quarter inch as well. So let's put my 02500 roughing toolpath. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this project. And I'm gonna reload in that file. So I'm just gonna take this uh, camera file and I'm gonna drag and drop it back into my PowerMill interface. And before I go any further, I'm just gonna go through my toolpath setup. So let's go ahead and create our work plane. Uh, where's our pickup on this part? Well, for this instance, I'm just going to place it on the bottom of my part. I'm going to rename that work plane G54. Let's go ahead and activate it. Let's create a block. And let's establish our safe zone or safe area. Okay. So now if we go back into the toolpath strategy selector, and if I go into my roughing strategies, I can see the three toolpaths that I just saved off from the same uh, previous example. So if I were to click on my roughing toolpath and hit OK, okay, so it's gonna open up the strategy form. I can make any changes, but most importantly, all of the parameters that I've stored in here, like tolerance, thickness, step over, They've all been stored from, from the past. It's a vortex um, uh, style. So even that has been stored. Anything that's been changed in here would be stored in that template. Or in, in this case, it's a strategy. So if there's something that I need to change, um, say thickness, maybe I wanna use both axial and radial thickness. I'm gonna hit okay. And I'm just gonna resave that back. I'm gonna overwrite it. So the next time I bring that file in, would retain that information that I just changed. As you can see here. Okay, so it even remembers the tool and the holder itself. So even though that I don't have the appropriate tool by name, uh, Parmo re will recreate both the, the cutting edge, the shank and the tool holder. Okay, so let's go ahead and close that. Um, another way we can kind of automate things is to bring in, say, our tools uh, when we first start a PowerMill project. We could have all our tools stored in our database. So if I click on the database, it's gonna take a little bit of time to load up, maybe for the first time. And in this case, I have 17 tools. Okay, it's not a whole lot. I mean, we could have hundreds and thousands of tools stored in here, but, um, I might want to bring in tools at every single project right at the very beginning, just so I have maybe my standardized tools that I use on most projects. So in this case, what I'm going to do is just, uh, I'm going to close this project down and I'm just going to load in all of these tools. So I'm going to go ahead and select the first one and I can select the last one, hold the shift button down, they'll all select or I can actually just click on this button here to select them all. So I'm gonna go ahead and create these tools. And we can see Palmo recreating these tools is definitely gonna take uh, a little bit of time. 17 tools shouldn't be too, too long, but if I, again, if I had, you know, 40, 50, 100 tools, um, this, this time would take a little bit longer. Okay, so I brought all those tools into this project. 
Now, we, there is a way that we can bring these tools in uh, with maybe perhaps one click of a button, and that would be a template object. A template object here. So a template object is a way we can bring in items into our Power Mall project that exists in our Explorer. So in this case, all I have right now are tools, but if I had boundaries or if I had patterns or work planes, those items by name would be stored into that template object. So if I did have a, a boundary with geometry, that geometry wouldn't be retained in the template, just the name, just keep that in mind. But in this case, we have physical tools. I'm gonna go ahead and save this as a template object. Oh, sorry, save as template object. And I'm gonna store this in that same folder. Maybe I create a new folder and I'm gonna call this uh, tools. And I'm gonna call this one, my tools. So I'm gonna close this. And now we're gonna re-import that template object. So again, remember, anything that was in the Explorer with a few exceptions would be brought in with that template. So we're gonna import template object, my tool, and it is considered a PowerMall template file. And quite instantly the tools are brought in and they're the same tools that are stored in the database. Now, the big difference is, is when we bring the tools in from a template object, it will only retain one instance of speeds and feeds per one material. So if I were to take a look at the center drill and go into the settings, underneath the cutting data, these tools were brought in uh, with cutting data stored for P20. Okay, so if I wanted to change the material and have the, the tools speed and feeds update, uh, it wouldn't update in the template. It would only update in the, the uh, tool database. But the workaround for that is just to create multiple template objects. Now the, the plus side to using a template object for tools was now I can kind of categorize these and keep things nice and neat and tidy. So let's go ahead and create some folders. And maybe this folder is gonna be uh, for drills. And then I'm gonna create another folder. And this folder is gonna be for end mills. Let's create another folder. And last one, let's create one for bullnose. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and select all the drills. I'll even classify the chamfer tool as a drill. And we're gonna drop them into this folder. And let's take all the end mills. Uh, the ball nose, and then let's put all the bull nose in this folder. So I'm gonna go ahead and re save over top of that template object. And save that. And let's go ahead and re-import that file back in. All right, so quick and easily, we've got our all of our tools brought in using that uh, template. And then we also have them all nice and uh, categorized, just keeps things nice and neat and tidy. So remember, uh, if you guys have any questions at all, um, feel free to ask away um, throughout this webinar. We'll go ahead and answer them uh, live and uh, um, on the spot if we can, okay? All right, so another way we can bring these in, instead of going to open the template object or importing the template object, we can create a, a simple macro to bring these files in. So when it comes to macros, let me just kind of jump back over to our, our PowerPoint slide here. 
and I'm going to advance it one. Okay, so what is a macro? A macro is a way that we could perform one single action or multiple actions in a single click. So we can create a macro by manually copying the environmental commands into a text document or recording the macro within, its, within itself, within PowerML. So probably the easiest way is the second part here by recording a macro. So if you haven't experimented with macros in PowerML at all, um, I highly suggest just recording one. It's, it's very simple. The record option is located on the home tab within the macro group, uh, right smack in the middle here, this red bullseye. So the very first thing that PowerML is gonna ask for me is when I record the macro, it's gonna ask for me where the macro is gonna be located and what the macro's name is gonna be. So in this case, I'm gonna save it in the same folder as I saved the template, which is in my tools folder. And I'm just gonna call this macro imports tools. And you notice that the extension is a .mac for macro. So right now, PowerML is recording all of our mouse button clicks. So it's not recording my mouse moving around in the screen, but if I were to click out in space one time, it will record that button. If I were to record something like um, going into the file, import template object, it will record some of those commands. Maybe not all of them, but it's gonna record some of them, the ones that are necessary. And I'm gonna select the .ptf file and I'm going to hit open. And we might get duplicates here, but we'll go ahead and test this in a second. But that's simply all I want this macro to do, just maybe a couple commands. So to stop the macro from recording, we're just gonna go back up to the same location and we're just gonna click on this button once again to stop the record. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what this macro did. I'm gonna minimize PowerMill and we're gonna go into that tools folder and I'm gonna open this up with some kind of text creator or editor. So there's multiple choices. Um, if you just wanna use Notepad, that's fine. Uh, or maybe like Notepad++ is kind of my preferred one, but you can use whichever one you're more comfortable with. So in this case, let's just go ahead and open this with uh, Notepad. So as I mentioned, uh, when I was moving my mouse around the screen, the graphic space, uh, when I clicked that one time, it recorded uh, a bunch of gibberish here. Uh, basically, this is the location of the click out in space. Uh, I believe this has something to do with uh, pixel points, but it's really unnecessary. I kind of highly recommend that we don't have this in our macros because if we were picking something, uh, we could pick off what we're trying to pick or we could pick on the something that we're not trying to pick. So I just suggest getting rid of it. Okay, so it's really two commands here that we want PowerMill to execute. It doesn't matter if there's spaces, as long as those commands run in sequence, how we want them to, uh, to act. So I'm just going to save that, overwrite it, close it. And let's just go ahead and do a file close here just to kind of refresh my PowerMill project. And I'm gonna drag and drop that file in. Just like anything else in PowerMill, a model, um, we can drag and drop a, a PowerMill macro into space as well and have it kind of run. Okay, so you can see it brought all those tools in for me, folders, everything, uh, just by dragging and dropping them in. So that's, could be some kind of, um, you know, down the road, if I wanted to bring macros in, I'd, I'd want to work a little bit cleaner. Maybe add a button up here in space, maybe on the quick access toolbar, maybe on a custom new tab. So let's go ahead and create a new custom tab because the quick access toolbar is nice and all, but I like having everything kind of closer uh, to my, uh, my ribbon. So to create a, a customized tab, if you will, just gonna go into this white space here and we're gonna right click and we're gonna customize the ribbon.
Okay, so there's a few different options here. We could also, in the same environment here, customize the quick access toolbar. Doesn't matter, but uh, in this case, again, we're creating a new tab up here, so we're gonna customize the ribbon. But that button's gonna bring me to the same location if I was customizing the quick access toolbar or customizing the ribbon. So let's go ahead and create a new tab. And this tab, we're gonna rename it. So I'm gonna make sure it's highlighted in light blue, as we see here. I'm gonna edit it, and I'm gonna rename this. And this could be my custom tab. Okay, so as soon as I hit okay, it's gonna create that custom tab, uh, but it's completely empty at this point in time. So let's go back to that same location. And now we're gonna create a new group within that the custom tab. Okay, uh, double clicked here. Let me just remove that. Let's create a new group. There we go. And we're gonna edit that group the same way we just did before. So this one could be my setup tools. And done. And within this new group, I'm going to add one of these items here. So we have a way of bringing in a macro button, which is a button to run or execute a macro, maybe one that we just recorded. We also have the option of running just a single command, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. And then we also have the option of bringing in an existing command that, find, that finds itself up in the ribbon here already into our custom tab. So if we were to stay within the ribbon button, uh, it's just a matter of finding the function that we're looking for and then placing it over here. So for this case, we're gonna go ahead and add a macro button. I'm gonna name this macro button uh, tools import. Uh, the description is our tool tip. So if you're familiar with PowerMo, if you hover over a command up in the ribbon, as you can see here, the tool tip pops up and kind of lets me know exactly what that function does. So we can also do this for our own custom macros. So this description here would be to import my tools into the PowerMo project. And then the macro, we're gonna go ahead and look for that macro, which is right here. And then last but not least, we're just gonna go ahead and find maybe a button that already exists or an icon from here that uh, best suits what that macro does or that button does. So maybe this tool with an arrow pointing down would be a good uh, button for us to place in here. And we're gonna add it over. And okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and test that macro once again. So let's go file close. Let's go back to my custom tab. And we're gonna test this by clicking it one time. And we can see it works. All our tools come in and everything's nice and categorized. Okay, so again, very simple execution here again two two commands but it's going to save me a lot of time by instead of going up into the tool database selecting all those tools manually maybe dropping them in i can just bring them in quick and easily by just a, a one button up in the ribbon okay so that's a recorded macro now there's another type of macro that we can run that we don't have to click on uh, we're going to call this a power Emerald pm user macro so you may or may not know this, but uh, when you open up PowerMill, uh, PowerMill is going to look at certain macros in the background. If it exists, it's going to run that macro with us, us having to tell PowerMill to run it. And one is called a PM user macro. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this. And you're going to notice right now I'm working in inches. And if I close PowerMill, I open up PowerMill once again, it should open up back up in inches. But if I had to work in millimeters, for instance, maybe, so maybe some uh, job popped up and I had to convert over to millimeters and then work in millimeters, the next time I open up in PowerMill, I wanna go back to inches. Well, if I'm not careful, I could already import my file. And at that point in time, I'd have to basically start over. 
So a PM user macro is something that will, again, execute as we open up the software. So we could go ahead and record a macro and have PowerMill act on that macro once we open up PowerMill, or we can also copy the commands from, from somewhere within PowerMill. So within the home tab, within the macro group, you'll notice that there's this echo commands. So if you click on this a couple times to just kind of pop open this command window down at the bottom, anytime we perform some kind of function in PowerMill, that command gets computed behind the behind the scenes. So if we were to go say, do an isometric view from uh, the right hand side here, that command is rotate transform ISO two. So if I were to copy that command, control C, control V for paste and change ISO two to say ISO four and hit enter, that command gets executed. So we can also find the commands by just looking at them through the echo commands and then we can copy and paste them into a, a, a macro. So let's minimize PowerMill. And I'm gonna go into this PMIL2 folder and I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna create a new text document. This time I'm gonna call this document PM for PowerMill and then USER for user. I'm gonna change the extension from .txt to .mac. And I do want to change it. So right now this is a macro, but it's an empty macro. There's nothing. So for instance, if I wanted PowerMill to open up and always start in inches, well, what I could do is go back to PowerMill, go back to file, options. Let's go to application options. And we're going to go into the unit system. And I'm going to change this back to millimeters for a second, and then I'm going to change it back to inches. And I'm going to copy this command. So you don't need the backslash or the R, that's just a carriage return to the next line. All I need is the, the physical command, which is anything in the hard brackets minus the backspace and the R. So control C for copy. I'm going to go back to our text file and control V for paste and then maybe I'll space it down. So something else I might want to place into my PM user macro could be maybe our autosave. So let's go to project, autosave project. So I'm going to change this value to say 60, 60 minutes and hit enter. And as soon as you hit enter, it's going to execute the command and the command is going to be right here. Project autosave. 60. So control C, bring this back over here, control V, and enter again. So the other option would be to maybe, um, one thing that I, I really despise in PowerMill, um, you may or may not be here with me, but private boundaries. Okay, so these things here are always on by default. Um, we can talk about private boundaries at another time, but I'm gonna go ahead and shut these off. So I'm gonna uncheck private boundary. And again, I'm gonna copy and paste this command. Control C, Control V. And let's go ahead and add another command in here. Maybe delete private boundaries. Uh, control C. So it's uh, it's a matter of just being a little bit finesse when you're grabbing those commands. But if you do this a few times, you'll know which uh, parts to bring in and which ones not to bring in. And last but not least, maybe I want to always be in rainbow shade. So I'm just going to flip it just to get the command. So view model rainbow shade. Control C. And finally, um, I like having my shading tolerance a little bit tighter than normal. Uh, you might see this when you bring a file in, you notice that you might get a lot of linearization on 
fillets or pocket corners. That's because our shading tolerance is set larger than it, it, it than it needs to be. It really depends on the, the types of models that you're working with. But in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and change that, make it a little bit tighter. So if you go back into the, uh, the view tab and underneath appearance, this little um, button on the bottom right hand corner, it's gonna open up my drawing options and my shading tolerance, maybe I wanna bring this down to half thou, enter. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy that command and paste it. And let's go ahead and save it. So just for testing purposes, uh, I'm gonna make this 10 thousandths. And let's go ahead and make this plain shade. And let's jump back up into our Paramol application options. And let's go ahead and change these private boundaries. Let's turn them back on, which they are. And let's go ahead and close Paramol and reopen it back up. Actually, before we get to that point, we do have to set up a path. So if I were to close Paramol and reopen it back up, uh, we would just kind of run into the same situation that we are in now because um, that PM user macro would, would not run. So we need to go back to where we were at the very beginning of this webinar. We need to tell Paramol to look in that specific location. So back to the home tab within the macro group, this little button in the bottom right hand corner. Let's change this to macro paths. I'm gonna add a path at the very top. And this is gonna be in the folder on my desktop, PML2. So Paramol is gonna look in that PM, PML2 folder upon startup. And if it finds a macro labeled pmuser.mac, it's gonna execute those commands when I open up the software. So let's go ahead and test this. Okay, so automatically I can see on the right-hand side, my viewing toolbar, my options for shading automatically flipped over to rainbow shade, opposed to plain shade. If we go over to our options, application options, and let's go ahead and look at our project auto shade, auto save, and we've got 60 minutes. So I know that that PM user macro ran behind the scenes uh, without any issues. One last thing, just to check, view appearance, and we can see my half dial shading tolerance is applied. So this is something that um, it's not difficult to set up. It's gonna save you a lot of headaches, especially if you wanna get your PowerMill environment set up to the way that you like it. So I highly encourage you to uh, go ahead and experiment with that, create one. Um, again, recording one is probably gonna be the easiest way to start out, but, um, Copy and pasting commands from the echo commands is, is not that far off, okay? So let's go through one last example here on how macros can help you out, um, out of the box. So let's go ahead and import that file in that we looked at before, that, uh, that camera file. So let's go into here and I'm going to drag and drop this file into the Paramount interface. Okay. So when we bring in a new file in from into Paramount, we're going to start working on it. We're always kind of taught to do the first th three things here when we go into tool pass setup. It's the first thing is maybe creating a datum for a pickup. The second thing would be to create our block. And then our third thing would be to establish our safe plane for a tool. Okay, so let's go ahead and record that. So again, let's record. And I'm gonna go back to my desktop. And I'm gonna put this in my PML2 folder. And I'm gonna call this one uh, setup. Okay, so it is recording as we speak. Again, it's not recording my mouse moving around. It only records clicks. So the very first click we're gonna do is we're going to create our block. 
So let's create our block. And let's just go ahead and calculate. And what I might do is just change the opacity to go to wireframe. Hit accept. And then let's go ahead and create a work plane. Position on block, like so. And then let's establish our safe connections. And I might draw the rapid surface. And then let's change the opacity. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that record. And let's go ahead and see what we recorded. Okay. So again, um, I clicked out in space. Um, I'm definitely not going to want that pick command. So I'm going to delete that right away. And another nice uh, thing we can do in here is kind of label what our macro is doing. So right now we've just got you know, a bunch of commands that execute. But for me, if I need to troubleshoot down the road, I really don't know what commands are doing here. So it's a really good practice in your macro to maybe put a space, a couple forward slashes, and then after that forward slash, I can just put uh, some comments in here. So when Paramo reads this macro, it's not going to run, it's not going to execute commands that are kind of hidden with those two forward slashes. So maybe my first command is going to be um, create the block. Okay, and that's going to be form block, edit block reset. And then if you remember, I changed it to wireframe. That's the command is edit block with draw mode set to zero. And then block accept accepts that form. Okay, so I can do some educated guesses as to what these are. Um, if you don't remember, you can just copy these commands and you can actually execute them within the, uh, the, the background commands there. Okay, another two forward slashes uh, creates the work plane. And then another couple forward slashes, uh, let's call this one creates the safety plane. Okay, so let's just jump back into Power Mode real quick. And one thing that I'm probably gonna wanna fix here is because I didn't, I never um, activated my work plane. And if I go ahead and activate my work plane, we can see all the block shifts on me, okay? So there's something in here I might wanna fix. And let's jump back into our block function. And if I were to set this to global transform, so let's open up our exo, echo command, sorry. And if I change this to global transform, that's the command edit block coordinate world. So this could be a whole new discussion later on, but what, this is going to do is going to lock this block to my global transform at all times. So if you've been in that uh, instance in PowerML where you've created your block first, then you create your work plane and the block kind of shifts on you, that's because the block by default always wants to move with the active work plane. Um, I want it to stay static or locked to the global transform. So I'm going to take this command, control C, because I'm going to edit this macro. And I'm going to place it up here, somewhere within my definition of creating the block. OK, uh, we also have the, the option here of creating the work plane. Now, I created the work plane somewhere out in space, right? I created it using the block form. What if um, I wanted to create the work plane on the bottom one day, or maybe it's got to be in a different location the next day? Well, a really simple way that we can interact with PowerMall during a macro is to actually pause the macro and give the user or myself some sets of commands or instructions. So let's go in here real quick. Uh, I'm just going to delete this portion. And in the 
create the work plane section here, I'm just going to type in the word macro pause. Okay. And it, after macro pause, I'm going to put a quotation and I'm going to give the user some instructions to create the work plane. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. And let's kind of test out this new macro here. So anytime I'm testing a macro, I do a lot of deleting of the model, re-importing the model back in. Another nice habit to get into is you can see the resi residual effect of my safety plane. I just always get in the habit of going back to the file, options and resetting the forms. And that's gonna clear that out. Okay, so let's bring that file back in. Oops, uh, Panel Project, let's bring the camera back in. And then let's go ahead and run that macro. Okay, so with that macro pause, it's gonna pop up. It's gonna instruct myself or the user to create the work plane. So right now the macro is not going to continue on until we hit resume. So let's go to create macro, or sorry, uh, create work plane. And maybe I wanna use work plane positioned on block. I'm gonna pick that corner and I'm gonna resume. So everything carries on as normal. The only thing is my work plane doesn't activate. So let's go ahead and edit that, that macro once again. So let's activate that work plane. You can see that the block stays where it is, but the safety plane shifts up because we've now changed the distance from the transform to here by whatever that value is. So let's go ahead and copy that command. So activate work plane one, control C. And I'm gonna paste that in. Now, what if we wanna rename this work plane? We don't want it to be work plane one, maybe we want it to be an established, um, you know, G54 or datum one. Okay, so let's go ahead and rename that work plane. I'm gonna call it G54. I'm gonna copy and paste that function as well. And maybe I put it in before I activate it. So there is something you can do here. Um, right now we're calling it work plane number one. We could remove this quotation one and we could just put a hashtag. And what this hashtag is gonna tell Paramal is it's going to rename the last work plane that was created as G54. So it's, it's kind of a good habit to use these kind of hotkeys because um, if we, for on accident, already created work plane one or a work plane came in from our file when we imported it and it was already number one, uh, we'd probably not get the work plane in the right location. So this is going to bypass that by renaming the work plane, the last work plane that was created as work plane G54. And then we wanna activate G54. So let's go ahead and save that. And let's retest that once again. And let's reset forms. Let's re-import that file. Okay, and let's execute that macro once again. Okay, so the macro pauses, it's asked me to create the work plane. So I'll use the work plane position on block function once again. Let's try this other corner, hit resume. So you can see it activates the work plane and it actually will call it G54. Okay, let's, um, let's put a little, bit of, a little bit more interaction in here. So let's go ahead and define maybe a, some kind of a variable. So maybe we want um, some interaction for the user to be able to put in a value of a distance between 
the top of my block and the rapid plane. So right now, when we create the rapid plane, we're using the default values. So let's go back into this macro real quick. And after creating the safety, or in within creating the safety plane, what I might do is just define a variable. So there's different methods on, on creating variables. There's um, a system variable, and then there's a user variable. Um, in this case, we're gonna create a user variable. This is gonna be something that I, I basically wanna capture something from some user input, and then I'm gonna use it later on. So I'm gonna type in this value real, and if you're brand new to writing macros, this real just indicates that the value that I place in to the input is a real number. So it's gonna, it could be 10.1, it could be 0 0.0555, but it can't, well, it can't be a whole number as well. If I typed in the value int here for integer, the number that I place into that input value would have to be a whole number, like one, two, three, four, and five. There's a, a lot of information on how this works up in the macro programming guide, which I'll show you uh, before we exit out today. So I'm defining a real value, and I'm gonna put this dollar sign here, and I'm gonna put VAR. This is, whatever I place in here is what I'm going to create the variable name as. So I can put whatever I want here. I, I like using VAR, just so when I look through here later on, I know that I'm establishing a variable. So VAR is me establishing a variable, and then I'm gonna put a name. So it could be uh, rapid. And then equals, and then what we're gonna do is put input. So this is gonna raise a little dialog box for me to input. And whatever I put in here is gonna be like a little um, query to the user. So I'm gonna put in enter the rapid height, like so. So when the user puts in the rapid height, uh, that's gonna get stored. So let's go ahead and uh, let's minimize this real quick. I'm gonna go back into toolpath connections and this rapid height value here, I'm just gonna go ahead and change it. All I'm, the only reason why I'm changing it is just so I can get the command down here. So even if I put in zero, it's gonna give me the edit toolpath safe area size zero. I'm gonna copy that command, I'm gonna bring it back in. And let's just go ahead and put it in here. And instead of putting zero here, I'm gonna type in that variable. So it's gonna be a dollar sign, I can actually come over here and copy and paste it. Control C, Control V. So whatever value I place in here, um, we're gonna basically input that value over here for, for myself automatically. Okay, so let's go ahead and close that. Um, that should all do well. I'm gonna leave that the way we see it. Let's go ahead and close this or save it. Let's test this once again. And let's make sure we reset the forms. And we're gonna import that file back in once again. And let's drag and drop that file back. Okay, so let's go ahead and create the work plane. Okay, so there's the, the query that pops up, enter the rapid height. So maybe I want it to be an inch and a half. And let's see here, did it place it in? It did not. So I failed somewhere on this macro. Uh, let's just take a quick peek here. Um, I probably should have this. Oh, uh, edit tool path. Uh, uh, 
no, I probably don't need that. So I think with that old command here, sorry, this just kind of overrides the value here. So if I hit calculate, it's just gonna override that value. So this is kind of troubleshooting here. Um, I don't need this line. So I can actually forward slash it if I want power mill to kind of skip over it. Let's save it. Let's try that once again. Reset forms. Let's drag and drop that file back in. Okay, let's create the work plane. Enter the rapid height, let's go two inches. And there we go. So now that value of two inches gets stored in my rapid height. One last thing here. Um, I really don't like looking at this transform. You know, once I establish my uh, my pickup, so what I might do is just undraw that. Undraw the transform. The command is undraw transform. Control C. Let's place that back in here. Undraws the re transform. Let's go ahead and save that. And let's go ahead and test this one last time. Actually, before we test it, let's go add it up into my custom tab. So let's go ahead, close. Reset forms. Let's go back to the home tab, right click, customize the ribbon. And let's go ahead and add that to my custom tab. Again, it's gonna be another ribbon button or sorry, macro button. This one's gonna be um, part setup. Sets up my model for machining. So it's gonna be my setup, the picture. Let's just find something that suits. and let's place it down below. So these arrows will toggle it in sequence. So in my custom tab, I've got importing my part or my tools and then I have my part set up. So let's go ahead and test this one last time by importing that file in. Okay, create the work plane. So I'm gonna go back home and everything works out. Okay, so I think uh, we'll leave that where we stand for today. Um, I'm willing to stay past the hour if anybody has any questions. Um, ho hopefully you guys learned something here. You can see how valuable, you know, some simple automation goes a long way. You know, recording a macro, a little bit of interaction with the macro. I didn't do anything too off the charts here. Um, you can take macros and, and keep them pr fairly simple, like we did here today, or you can take macros and get uh, very complex with macros. Um, personally, I use macros for more on the setup process, um, but there are a lot of people out there that take macros to the next level. Um, we might touch on a little bit next, next uh, Friday, or sorry, this upcoming Friday when it comes to doing a little bit more interaction. But again, it's just a, a basic overview of you know what you can do with these uh, these macros by recording them, taking them, taking them on, and doing things to them to kind of streamline your process. If you want to get a little bit more comfortable on writing and recording macros, uh, if you're not aware, if you go to the help menu up top, if you go to documentation, there's a macro programming guide. You can download this as a PDF. You can print it out. Uh, it's a good read, it's about 150 pages. It goes from point A to point B with everything in between. So it's, it's uh, good to at least look over. All right, so do we have any questions out there today? Rob, can you see any questions? Yeah, there was one question 
uh, Christopher Crane answered it. Okay. Uh, but um, not sure. Do you want me to read it out just in case? Or? Yeah, in case uh, anybody else was wondering the same thing. But yeah, yeah, go for it. Can I save my feeds and speeds in the tool as, uh, as well as if I use the template? Sorry. If you said that already, I missed that question. So, um, <laughs> speeds and speeds. Yeah, there's, well, you know, just to answer that question anyway, um, there's different ways you can store speeds and feeds with your tool. Um, there's within the database, obviously, right? You can also store it within the, da the, the tool path uh, template, which we looked at right at the very beginning. So, if I store the, the Paramount strategy, um, it's going to load in the tools for me. So for instance, this quarter inch flat roughing tool, it's gonna to bring the tool path in eventually, there we go. So if I were to go into feeds and speeds here and I change the value to say, you know, maybe 5,000 RPM at 125 inches per minute, you know, uh, 2,500 skim, even the coolant value, maybe I wanna flood and hit okay. If I store this back here the next time i bring that that template in it's going to automatically bring all those speeds and feeds in with this tool so that's one method the other method is storing it directly within the tool like you asked so if you go into the settings underneath cutting data and there's a, a variety of different uh types of cutting data uh general will get most all of them but you know if you want to basically pinpoint it down to a certain task. You can change the speed and feeds for that task. But uh, whatever values is stored in here and you store it back into the tool database, uh, retains those speeds and feeds. But again, just kind of what I mentioned at the very beginning, it really depends on, you know, what type of material. So you can store that speed and feed for a different material, but you're gonna to wanna to bring it into PowerMill, change speed and feed and re-export it back into the database. Now on the flip side of that, um, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you want to investigate on your own, I highly suggest if you're storing tools to the database, do not leave them in the default location. That's number one. Copy that database out, move it somewhere else. Um, I got everything stored in my local system. I place everything, customize whatever, in my local C drive, DCAM folder. I've got all my stuff in here, so that way, I can create backups of these folders. And if I got move into a new computer, say next week, I can just copy that in entire folder and bring it into my new PC. And then it's just a matter of me linking all my paths back up. But I would assume you, you, can, you, can, you can also use like a, um, your OneDrive or more. Yeah, Fox definitely. It's a good or, place to store a backup for sure. Definitely. Um, but yeah, if you want to pull from the OneDrive or from a server, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can. But what I was going to show you is this database file. It's it's a renamed database. If I double click on it, you can open this up with Microsoft Access. And if I go into my Endmills page, now we got to enable the content first. If I go into my Endmills page, uh, nope, sorry. Uh, tool holders, nope. Sorry, it's been a while since I've been here. Oh, double click. Okay, yeah, double click on Endmills. So, when I double click on end mills, these are all my end mills. And you'll notice if I kind of scroll, you can see the holder that comes in with it by default. But speeds and feeds, I believe, are stored in here somewhere. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought they were stored in here. Uh, feed override, speed override, 100%. No, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Nix that. <laughs> But you can edit tools in that in that uh, tool database. But I again, if I suggest, if you're going to go that route, just um, keep a backup. I always keep a backup just in case. Store in a couple places because nothing is a uh, more horrible feeling if you lose your uh, your database. I've seen customers go through it. It's, it's painful. Well, I would say as well when you're upgrading from one version to another, you are moving your your files. You might be removing the old. Uh, information so it's helpful yeah there. and what happens too is that um say say PowerMill 2021 comes out and you remove PowerMill 2020 
and maybe you're pulling the, the tools from that database and you didn't update the, the new database for 2020, that's a good instance where tools can get lost. So just take them out of the default directories. If you're not sure where that is, it's C drive, program files, Autodesk. These were all of your files are installed. If you go to PowerMill 2020 in this case, so if you just install PowerMill 2020 and you're just gonna start creating a, a tool database, if you go into PowerMill 2020 and you go to file, tool DB, that's the default database. So I highly suggest you just copy it out, put it somewhere local, and then start saving your tools to that offshore database. Is that the only question we have? Yes, that's the only question. All right, sorry I rambled on about it, but <laughs> some good important information there about oh, people to realize, so. Great information. All right, guys, well, if there's, if there's no more questions, um, just remember that we have another hour on Friday that uh, we're gonna basically expand on this. Uh, hopefully you guys turn out for it. Um, it again, it's gonna be at from 2.30 Eastern time to 3.30 Eastern time, so. Um, hope to see you guys here on Friday. Thanks for showing up, everyone. Great job. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.